What's going on guys, it's Clutch Plays, and it's been a rough week so far for all Knicks fans as the Knicks continue to choke at the end of every single game that they play. In the first three regular season games versus the Spurs, Nets, and Celtics, we discovered quite a few new things about the Knicks players, but even more so about the Knicks coaching staff. The worst part about these first three games are that in every single one of them, the Knicks have been up by a large amount or have had a lead late in the game, but find some way to lose. Right when all of us have a bit of hope and we're like, oh, okay, the Knicks can actually win this. The Knicks end up choking and leaving everyone depressed. However, this isn't really anything new for Knicks fans. Even though the Knicks lost their first three games of the season in a disappointing fashion, there were still some significant bright spots coming out of all of these games. We may have found our next star player, we realized where and when certain players should be put into the game, and much more. Before I get into this video, I'm sorry I haven't uploaded like at all this week. My power has been out, so I haven't been able to post anything. Also, all the stats in this video are coming off the top of my head for the most part and from what I remember, so please forgive me if I get any small things wrong, but for the majority of the stuff, it should be correct. So with that said, let's get into six things that we learned from the Knicks' first three games this season. Number one, Alonzo Trier cannot start. I have absolutely no clue what Fizzle was thinking when he decided to start Trier versus the Spurs, but he did it anyways. This move was made because Fizz apparently liked the way RJ and Trier played together in training camp, so he decided to start both of them. Trier is a heavy isolation scorer and plays best when he can get into a rhythm early on in the game. Putting Trier into the starting lineup, a place where he has never been before, next to other ball dominant players does not seem like a recipe for success. I know this is easy to say hindsight knowing that this did not work out, but just looking at his game style it's obvious that he's a six man rather than a starter. Trier missed both of his shots and only played seven minutes versus the Spurs, but in the second game coming off of the bench versus the Nets, he had his best game yet and maybe in his career, scoring 22 points on only six of seven shooting. Now there should be absolutely no discussion of what Trier's role on the Knicks should be this season, and please make him have consistent minutes as well. Number two, RJ Barrett will be a star in this league. RJ Barrett has been special in his first few few games as a Nick. The Knicks have never had a rookie that has performed this well in their first few games as a Nick, not even Porzingis. RJ is the second youngest player in the NBA to ever score 20 points and has averaged 21 points on over 50% shooting in his first three games. The main concern with RJ coming into the season was his jump shot, but through his first three games he has looked like James Harden and he has shot 13 threes and made 7 of them, which averages out to about 53%. The ability to have a jump shot this this early in his career is so special because as he gets older, he will become a better shooter with more repetition. Also, now defenders have to respect his jump shot, which makes getting to the paint so much easier. For example, in the first possession of the second half versus the Celtics, Gordon Hayward had to close out on RJ, which led to an easy drive and dunk for him. On top of all this, his defense may be the most impressive thing about his game, as he has had no trouble on the defensive side of the ball while racking up 2.7 steals per game. In versus the Nets, he had 6 steals. This isn't even counting bad passes that were forced or traveling calls as well. This man is not scared of anyone and is going to go right at each and every defender he goes up against in the NBA. Even last night at the end of the game, he went right at the 7.5 footer taco ball instead of taking a contested floater like most other NBA players probably would have. There are so many positives coming out of RJ's game through the first three games, but he does need to clean up on his turnovers, especially his traveling calls, and not always go for the poster dunk. These negatives though are easily fixed with more experience in the NBA, so as long as he keeps playing the same way he is now, we have to do everything that we can to build around him for the future. Number 3. Fizdale is clueless. Now the Knicks have lost their first three games, but the person who should be getting the majority of the blame is David Fizdale. He seems completely clueless at times, and his decision making is absolutely terrible. I already talked about this kind of with the Trier situation, which made no sense at the time and clearly did not work. Next, can you tell me why Frank Nilakina is on the bench when Kemba Walker is going off? Fizz said before the game that Frank was going to be in his back pocket, yet he basically straight up lied to us. Kemba had 32 points in this game, with the majority coming in the second half of the game. Frank absolutely locked up Kemba in the France vs USA FIBA game, and his length would have severely limited Kemba who's only 6 feet tall. I don't understand why Fizz treats Frank and DSJ differently, because the gap between Frank and DSJ right now is not all that big, and when DSJ 
PSJ is playing poorly, Frank should be playing. Everyone knows that Frank can impact the game defensively, rather than DSJ who is just a liability on both sides of the ball. Finally, why on earth is Wayne Ellington not in the next game after he makes 3 straight threes versus the Nets in crunch time? The Knicks shot under 30% from 3 point range versus the Celtics, and really could have benefited with multiple 3 point threats on the floor. And you know it's bad when I'm saying that Wayne Ellington deserves minutes. The overall rotations have not been as bad to start the year actually, but some of the decisions decisions that Fizdale makes about whether to put in or not to put in certain players is just baffling. Number 4. Stop the isolation. This is another thing that should be pitted on Fizdale's shoulders because the Knicks offense is the most stagnant offense in the entire NBA right now. The Knicks play a freelance offense with few set plays which has led the Knicks to playing way too much isolation. Fizz wants to move the ball and have lots of action off the ball, but he hasn't implemented anything to do so. The two times we have actually run a play with multiple options, screens, and lots of movement off the ball, we got two wide open shots for Wayne Ellington, which he drained with ease. This team is full of brand new players, and it's idiotic to think that this team, who's not even been together for an entire month yet, will be able to set screens and move without the ball consistently without any guide. The isolation is worse at the end of the games when Fizz doesn't call out a play or have a set offense that the Knicks can go by. Even in the final few minutes of close games in the preseason, this was an issue, but Fizz has yet to do anything to fix it. Only Julius Randle and RJ, and maybe Mitch and RJ, have shown that they have a true connection on the floor and everyone else is still adjusting to the new faces that they are playing with. Also, Frank is not an isolation point guard at all, and as long as this is the offense that the Knicks are running, Frank will have no role on this team. To stop the isolation, Fizz needs to implement a lot more plays with multiple options, and over time the Knicks should be able to gain the chemistry needed to play the way that Fizz wants them to. Something needs to change, and if Fizz doesn't do something quick, his name is going to be on the hot seat. I'm not on the fire Fizz train yet though. Number 5. Keith Smart deserves to be fired. Some of you guys are probably confused right now, but Keith Smart is the Knicks shooting coach. More specifically, he is the one that tweaked DSJ's jump shot this summer in hopes to make his shot better. DSJ would be so much more deadly with the shot because he would have a much easier time penetrating the paint, especially since defenders would have to respect his shot, similar to what RJ has right now. DSJ was working so hard on improving his shot, but it looks 10 times worse this year than it looked last year. It looks so much more awkward and uncomfortable, and he has not made a single jump shot the entire regular season. I don't know if his injury is still affecting him, but if DSJ is completely fine, this is what his shot continues to look like, I can unanimously say for all Knicks fans everywhere that Keith Smart not only deserves to be fired, but banned from all Knicks facilities. At least as a shooting coach, I, I don't know if he's a good assistant or not, but shooting wise, he's gone. I've not lost hope in DSJ just yet, but his jump shot gets uglier and uglier each game he plays. Also, booing DSJ is not going to work, and he may deserve it, but booing him only diminishes his confidence confidence and hurts him, so if you're at the game, don't boo him please. Number 6. Mitch is ready to break out. Mitch was hurt for the first game of the season versus the Spurs, but in the next two games he didn't play all that much. This was partly due to foul trouble, but in the minutes that he did play, he impacted the game significantly. He has played 18 minutes per game and averaged 2 blocks and 2 steals in that time. Also, he has averaged a bit over 10 points per game while shooting over 90% from the field. These stats are amazing and all. But the real reason Mitch is about to break out is because of his 36.62 PER. PER basically determines how impactful a player is in the amount of minutes he plays. So for example, DSJ has a negative 10 PER right now. Once Mitch is finally able to stay out of foul trouble consistently, he should increase his averages and percentages significantly as well. RJ is always looking to give Mitch an easy bucket, and this duo is going to be something special for the years to come. All in all, the Knicks have had a very up and down first three games, and even though we lost, there are quite a few positives coming out of these games. If we can fix a couple of these things quick, then we could have a serious shot at a playoff spot because we definitely have the talent to get into the playoffs, but the coaching staff needs to improve. In every game, we have been in the driver's seat at some point, but just have not been able to pull away or close out the game. Hopefully Julius or RJ can step up as the closer for the Knicks, or actually the Knicks can learn how to move the ball around and move off the ball throughout the entire game. Every game was pretty frustrating watching, but we have a must win game coming versus the Bulls and we better win this game. Tell me what you guys thought about this video 
and if you guys think that there is anything that I forgot to cover as well. Also, tell me if you guys are on the Keep Fisdale train, or you guys want him to be fired, because it seems relatively mixed as of right now. With that said, if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like. Now I'm out, and PEACE!